The biblical significance of the ancient port city of Caesarea cannot be understated. Caesarea is believed to have been built on the ruins of what was known as Stratton's Tower in 22 BC by Herod the Great. Herod's ambitious 12-year construction project consisted of a deep sea harbor built with storerooms, markets, wide roads, baths, temples to Rome and Augustus, and other imposing public buildings. Every five years, the city hosted major sporting competitions, gladiator games, and theatrical productions in its theater and hippodrome overlooking the Mediterranean Sea. This is the city as it existed in the time of the Book of Acts and would play a pivotal role in the life of the Apostle Paul. I'm Dan Cathcart and this is Shadows in the Land of Israel. In the book of Acts, chapter 21, Paul is in the port city of Miletus, in what is today modern Turkey, on what would be his final journey up to Jerusalem. Look at Acts 21, verses 1 through 8. Now it came to pass that when we had departed from them and set sail, running a straight course, we came to Kos. The following day to Rhodes, and from there to Petara. And finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left, sailing to Syria, and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload her cargo. And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. Now they told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. When we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went our way and they all accompanied us with their wives and children till we were out of the city. Then we knelt down on the shore and prayed. When we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship and they returned home. And when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemaeus, greeted the brethren, and stayed with them one day. On the next day, we who were Paul's company departed and came to Caesarea, and entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Paul and his traveling companion stayed with Philip for several days, and as with their many encounters with believers along the way, Paul was warned and urged not to go up to Jerusalem. But Paul insisted, and with other disciples from Caesarea joining him, he went to Jerusalem to meet with the brethren there. Look at Acts 21, 17 through 22. And when he had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. And when they had greeted them, he told them in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they had heard it, they glorified the Lord, and they said to him, you see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they were all jealous for the law? But they have been informed about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, nor walk according to the customs. What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Before meeting with the full assembly, Paul is asked that when he fulfills his Nazarite vow, which he had earlier taken, and which was a prime reason in him traveling to Jerusalem, that he also assist four other men who have taken the same vow by providing their required sacrifices in the temple, in addition to his own to complete the purification. Now this is a big deal. These required sacrifices are expensive to acquire. Paul was asked to do this to prove that he followed the law. Look at Acts 21, verse 24. Take them and be purified with them, and pay their expenses, so that they may shave their heads, and that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. 
But even this does not protect Paul from those who are conspiring against him. Look at Acts 21, verses 27 through 29. Now when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. And furthermore, he brought Greeks into the temple, and he defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. So the political system at the time was extremely corrupt, and the Jewish leadership was not immune to this corruption, and were, in fact, an active participant in it. Many of the Jewish leadership of the day practiced a pagan or Hellenized version of the Jewish religion, intermixing Greek and Roman deities in their daily lives. Now, Paul was one that was counted among them as a prominent prosecutor of the believers in the way, attempting to purge them from the synagogues and the Jewish communities. Paul was a highly educated man from a wealthy family in the city of Tarsus. Tarsus was the center for higher education in the Greek and Roman world of the day. In his teenage years, Paul was sent to Jerusalem to continue his education with his Jewish heritage under one of the most prominent rabbis, Gamaliel, who was a leading authority in the Sanhedrin and in the early first century. He was also the son of Simon ben Hillel and the grandson of the great Jewish teacher Hillel the Elder. Now, Paul describes himself as a devout Jew. Look at Acts 22, verse 3. I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous towards God as you are today. So after these so-called leaders of the Jewish community cry out for help from the people, the general crowd in the temple courtyards, Paul was seized by a mob and dragged from the temple and beaten. But before they could kill him, Paul was rescued by Roman soldiers. Look at Acts 21, 30 through 34. And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seizing Paul, and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. Now they were seeking to kill him. News came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. And he asked who he was and what he had done. And some among the multitude cried one thing and some the other. So then he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult. He commanded him to be taken to the barracks. So Paul is led away by the soldiers. He requests that he be allowed to address the mob. Now beginning at chapter 22, verse 3, and continuing. I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our fathers the law, and was zealous toward God as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering unto prisons both men and women. Also the high priest bears me witness and all the counsel of the elders, from whom I also received letters to the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. Paul's lengthy address goes on to explain his previous zealous pursuit and persecution of the believers of the way, and then on through his experience on the road to Damascus, and he ends by telling them of the Lord's instruction for him to go to the Gentiles with the good news of the Messiah, at which point the crowd once again turns on him in anger. Look at Acts 22, verses 20 and 21. And then the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by, consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. When he said to me, Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Now the Romans did not take too kindly to troublemakers among the common people of the territories. 
These Jewish leaders in the crowd were not only angered by Paul's betrayal of trust, for Paul was previously commissioned by the high priest to persecute the believers in Yeshua, but also for his going to the Gentiles. So at this time in history, for a devout Jew, as Paul certainly was, to associate with Gentiles was a direct violation of Jewish tradition and oral law, and was a grave offense deserving of death. The Roman commander, after witnessing the reactions of the crowd to Paul's dissertation, orders Paul to be scourged as a punishment for his making trouble. Now Paul's response to these orders and the reaction of the commander set in motion a chain of events that will change Paul's life forever. Look at Acts 22, 25-29. And as they bound him with throngs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander, saying, Take care what you do, for this man is a Roman. Then the commander came in and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, Yes. The commander answered, With a large sum I obtained this citizenship. And Paul said, But I was born a citizen. Then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him, and the commander was also afraid after he found out that Paul was a Roman, and because he had him bound. So Paul, as a Roman citizen, had special privileges and rights that the average Jewish resident did not. It was highly unusual for a Jew in Paul's position to be an active, participating Pharisee to also be a Roman citizen. The next day, Paul is given an audience before the chief priests and all their council. Look at Acts 23, 6-9. But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other part Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Of hope and resurrection of the dead I am called in question. And when he had said so, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil with this man. But if a spirit or an angel hath spoken to him, let us not fight against God. The gathered Jewish leadership grew highly agitated, and to protect Paul from harm, the Roman commander had Paul removed to the barracks for his own protection. Later, learning that there was a secret plot of some of the Jews to kill Paul, and that the high priest Ananias, along with his hired gun, Tertullius, were about to accuse Paul of a capital offense of sedition, the Roman commander had Paul transferred under heavy guard to Caesarea to appear before the territorial governor, Felix. Twelve days later, Paul appears before Felix. Look at Acts 24, 10-16. Then Paul, after the governor had nodded to him to speak, answered, Inasmuch as I know that you have been for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself because you may ascertain that it is no more than twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship, and they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone, nor inciting the crowd, neither in the synagogues or in the city, nor can they prove the things which they now accuse me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. For two years Paul is placed under house arrest, and his fate remains in limbo. Festus eventually replaces Felix as territorial governor, and once again Paul is brought before the governor and the Jewish leaders from Jerusalem. Look at Acts 25, 7-12. When he, that is Paul, had come, 
The Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood about and laid many serious complaints against Paul, which they could not prove, while he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I offended in anything at all. But Festus, wanting to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and there be judged before me concerning these things? So Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat, where I ought to be judged. To the Jew I have done no wrong, as you very well know. For if I am an offender or have committed anything deserving of death, I do not object to dying. But if there is nothing in these things of which these men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, You have appealed to Caesar, and to Caesar you shall go. So there on the shores of the great sea, in the magnificent and opulent port city of Caesarea, Paul's fate is sealed. He is eventually taken to Rome to appear before Caesar and awaits his day in court under house arrest. The story of Paul's ordeal at Jerusalem and Caesarea is lengthy, covered in Acts chapters 21 through 25. Paul, being highly educated and intelligent, clearly understood his rights as a Roman citizen and on several occasions used his citizenship to his advantage and to save his own life, as well as to spread the gospel of Yeshua to the Roman Gentile world, carrying the message to jailers, shipmates, kings, governors, and to the emperor. I'm Dan Cathcart, and this is Shadows in the Land of Israel. Shalom, and be blessed.